For the last month and a half, we've been preoccupied with what is happening in Gaza because it can be described as really nothing less than a genocide uh, enabled, funded by this government. But this film brings me back to the days that I, I spent in Palestine. I moved to Palestine after I graduated from college and spent from about 2000 until 2004 there. I went back in 2007 and through the years working on advocacy with the International Solidarity Movement and working with most of the people that you saw in this film. So I've known these little girls since, well, well, since they were little and, uh, and their parents. Uh, Basim, who is Ahed's father, you saw, was just rearrested by the Israeli military about 10 days ago. And the only thing we know is that yeah, they're holding him without any charge, which they frequently do. They have something which we call, they call, we call those administrative detention, which is more like internment. They um, hold Palestinians without charge, without trial. They can hold you up to six months like that. And then frequently they renew it. So like a few days before the six months are over and they're supposed to charge you or release you, then they renew it for another six months. And some Palestinians spend years of their life like that without ever being charged with anything. And then about five days ago, they rearrested Ahed Tamimi. She was arrested in 2017, as you saw, for slapping a soldier who had just shot her cousin actually in the head. And his, he survived, but his head is, he's missing part of his brain. And then he was on her land, like, in her yard um so she went to confront him as you saw some pictures of her frequently confronting soldiers and she slapped the soldier which footage of went viral and israel saw it as some kind of you know embarrassment to them and to their macho um exterior whatever so there were all these calls from uh, israelis for her arrest and that's why they arrested her and she was held for about six, uh, sorry, eight months. Eight months uh, before she was released. You know, she talked about wanting to be a soccer player. Uh, she ended up going to law school because like her, like her cousin Jenna, who wants to be an attorney, most Palestinian kids think about what they can do to serve the cause of freedom instead of actually pursuing what they, they want to do. It's like they find this obligation. There's a book that came out, I think, last year about Ahad's story. It's written by Ahad and another uh, journalist. And it's called, They Call Me Lioness. And in that book, something I didn't know, but she talks about not liking these demonstrations that took place. She, they scared her. And for a while, she stayed and cowered in her home while the rest of the family and the village went out to demonstrate. But eventually she realized, and what she also talks about, and her dad talks about, is like, why do Palestinian, Palestinians are often criticized, you put your children up front, why do you even expose them, why do you let them come to these demonstrations, because you know the soldiers get very violent. And she talks about once being in her home during a demonstration, but the soldiers fired tear gas into her house and she was suffocating, and then that was just one instance, and there was another instance similar to that, where a lot of women and children were in a house in the village that tear gas came into, and they were trapped. So there, what she says is we're not any safer in our homes. At least we're out in the air when we're marching, we're with each other. Uh, and that is the life of the Palestinians that, that resist. They are arrested, they are maimed, they are killed, and nobody is ever held accountable. No, I, from all of the, the years that I've been there, Israel has really never held anybody accountable and in the few times where the violations have been so egregious that they got international attention they say that they are investigating sometimes they will say you know that they um sentenced a soldier or whatnot but as soon as the international attention is gone the soldier is released and you never get accountability for those who are in charge right this is what is happening a little bit, just a little glimpse of what's happening in the West Bank, which has gotten exponentially worse in the last month and a half. Now Palestinians can barely leave their homes. You have settlers, and I think that that's kind of a mild word because some people might have a positive view of the word settlers, but what they are are Jewish Israelis 
and they sit on these, they live in these pristine homes that you saw, the red rooftops, which are built on confiscated Palestinian land, and then the Israeli government takes more Palestinian land to build roads for them so they can bypass Palestinian villages and go into Israel without ever having to go into villages and to build networks for them. They get all the water, Palestinians are denied water, so they will have foliage and swimming pools while Palestinians um, are denied water and oftentimes have to buy it from Israel at exorbitantly high rates because Israel actually took their water resources. Uh, but these settlers, now a lot of them are, are fanatic and they are armed and they have been terrorizing Palestinian villagers. Um, as of the last report I saw, 15 villages have been depopulated because these, so these settlers come in armed, they detain, they beat people and then they give them a certain time to leave or be killed. So 15 villages, the last report I got, have been depopulated just in the last few weeks because there's no accountability for these settlers either. And one of, I mean, as if that isn't egregious enough, Israel has been rounding up. So they arrested Ahed and they arrested her father, uh, but they have arrested almost 2,000 others uh, whether they have charged them or not, I don't know. I don't have, you know, the statistics for all of them. But what I know that they've been doing is grossly abusing and torturing some of these detainees and then posting them online. So you will, can find footage of Palestinian men being stripped naked, blindfolded, bound, kicked around, dragged, um, made fun of, and then posted online and no accountability, so nobody does anything about it. You know, but Palestinians resist a little bit and they are, as you saw, they know, we know that we are terrorists because we're not supposed to resist, we're just supposed to accept that this is how we live. It is um, as if, well it is, Israel does give Palestinians the only option of accept permanent subjugation or, you know, face the violent consequences and the world seems to accept that. So what happened is everyone heard about the Hamas operation on October 7th. That was just an instance and, and probably the, and the biggest instance of like a coordinated attack on the oppressors. Now, I don't ever, would never justify attacks on civilians. I mean, as an international lawyer, as a human being, I see that, I mean, it's unlawful, it is unjust. But the way we stop it is not to say these Palestinians are terrorists and they need to be wiped out because that doesn't work. And it is ignoring decades of, of oppression and then allowing the occupier and the oppressor to use these brute, brute force to continue. What Palestinians understand is an attempt to completely get rid of us. Okay, because Israel, we talk about it being an occupation, but it was founded as a settler colonial project. They don't, their founders don't deny it. And through the decades, from 1948 until today, there have been these policies. You saw briefly maps on there, how they have squeezed us into smaller and smaller areas of land and made it really almost impossible to live, very difficult to resist. Gaza specifically is the size of Detroit. Hey, it's 140 square miles. 2.2 million people live there. 70% of them are refugees from our original homeland, from their original homeland, which is inside Israel. And they're walled and caged off. And there used to be these colony settlements like in the West Bank in Gaza, but in 2005, Israel pulled them out and then told the world, we don't occupy Gaza anymore. Okay, so Gaza, what they say is Gaza is free. But under international law, what constitutes an occupation is not, it's not judged by how much boots you have on the ground, it's by how much effective control a, a force has over a territory. And Israel controls Gaza by air, sea, and land, so nothing. We, they don't have control of their airspace, no planes, they don't have control of their sea waters, they don't have control of any of their land borders. Israel controls everything that gets in and out. And in 2000, when they pulled out in 2005, I mean, it was sealed, okay? But in 2007, they 
really um, exacerbated or, or totally sealed it off by restricting the people that go in and out and, and what can get in and out to a level that doesn't really make sense, except for one Israeli minister and advisor to the prime minister at the time explained it as we're going to put them on a diet. You know, that was a Dove Wise class. He was a, an advisor to Prime Minister Ali Sharon. So we're not going to totally starve them, but they wanted to uh, kind of beat them into submission. So what does that mean? That means that you, your economy is devastated. You can't import raw materials to produce, and even what you can produce, you can't export unless it goes through Israel. So for example, Gaza has beautiful uh, carnations and strawberries, the best strawberries I've ever tasted in my life, but they can't export them without going through Israel. And those were, that was heavily restricted. Certain medicines couldn't get in. Uh, so when I went, was talking to doctors, I tell you the list of, of things that Israel doesn't allow in, that doesn't allow them to treat, to properly treat uh, their patients. So a story too that I will never forget, and it is a, just, I, I think it gives a, um, can maybe a, a glimpse into how Palestinians specifically in Gaza have absolutely no control of their lives. But it is the story of a young girl named Aisha Lulu. Okay? Aisha is a five-year-old girl, lived in Gaza, very bright, bubbly, loved by everyone until suddenly she started not feeling well and throwing up all the time. Uh, she was finally diagnosed with a brain tumor. She could not be treated in Gaza. So she had to go to a hospital about an hour and a half away in Jerusalem, actually the hospital where my kids were born. She had to apply for permission from the Israeli military, of course, so her parents applied for permission. And she received permission, but her mom was denied permission. And her dad was denied permission. And her aunts and uncles were denied permission. And everyone she knew was denied permission to go with her for brain surgery. Eventually, they found a woman who had permission, an elderly woman, and she was the only one that could accompany Aisha in a taxi out of Gaza to go with brain surgery. And she got the brain surgery, and it was successful, but she kept calling for her mom. So the doctor told her mom that you have to find a way to get here, because even though her surgery was successful, she's so upset she is deteriorating. Her mom could not get permission. And within a few days, Aisha died alone. Now I feel pain for Aisha, but as a mother, knowing your daughter was only a few miles away and you can't get there, and your daughter died alone, it's something I can't really comprehend. And there's no security purpose in that because Israel tells the world that Gaza and Palestinians are so dangerous that we have to have these policies. There are policies intended to punish. Okay? And so on October 7th, when Hamas carried out this operation, it was a surprise in terms of how kind of coordinated it was, like how did they build and train in flying hang gliders without Israel knowing? Because this is the most surveilled piece of territory like in the world, right? So I, I, I don't know if I believe that Israel really didn't know about it, but when Israel then used that as an excuse to, now they're gonna defend themselves by what they're doing now is inaccurate because under international law, I said that they were the occupying power. They are the colonizers. You don't have a right of self-defense against people that you colonize and that you occupy. Israel does have a responsibility to keep their citizens safe by taking proportional measures to keep their citizens, to ensure the health and well-being of their citizens. They also have a responsibility for the health and well-being of the people that they occupy. But instead of living up to those obligations, they impose collective punishment. So that before October 7th, you had nearly 50% unemployment rate. You had about 70, 80% of the people living in Gaza that were food aid dependent. 
I already mentioned 70% of them were refugees, 50% of them are children. And after Israel totally sealed this territory, what we're seeing now, this, this pummeling of Gaza, that is at least the fifth major time that they pummeled Gaza since they closed the territory. So in 2008 and 2012, 2014, 2018, tens of thousands of Palestinians marched non-violently in what they called the Gaza, the March of Return. And Israeli soldiers were stationed on hilltops and just shot at them, like caged, whatever, fish in a barrel, whatever, whatever term that you want to use, killed over 200, I think 220 about, maimed tens of thousands, including like a whole generation of, of kids that are now uh, amputees. And no one was held accountable for a nonviolent resistance. Then they pummeled Gaza again in 2021. So the number of buildings destroyed, people killed, just in the last decade is enormous. And the last time I was in Gaza in 2009, I went with a delegation of lawyers, actually sponsored by the National Lawyers Guild, to investigate what US weapons were used in committing war crimes. And the stories we heard were atrocious. People talking to us on top of the, you know, the rubble of their homes. One of the stories, a man was telling us a tank, an Israeli tank, was sitting right outside his home with the turret point at his home. He remembers a soldier kind of eating potato chips and they came out with their hands up and some white sheets, white flags, and the soldiers opened fire, killing two young girls, two daughters. Another um, situation that we encountered and we documented is the story of a family where they all sheltered the extended family in one home that the Israelis shelled. Right? After shelling this home, not knowing how many people remained alive inside, the Israelis prevented the International Committee of the Red Cross from getting to the home to see if there were any survivors. For three days, after three days, they finally let the ICRC in, they found eight surviving children that had no food for three days and that were surrounded by the dead bodies of their parents. That was in 2009. If those children survived the bombings of 2012, 14, the, the shootings of the Gaza March of Return 2018 or the bombings of 2021, would they have joined Hamas? Did they infiltrate on, on October 7th? And what we're witnessing now, three weeks into this, three weeks into this, so already almost three weeks ago, Save the Children put out an urgent press release saying, in three weeks, Israel has killed more children in Gaza than the annual number of children killed across all conflict zones since 2019, that urgent intervention is needed. And for the past week, the UN Secretary General has been saying that Gaza has become a graveyard for children. And those children who are lucky enough to survive sometimes are the only survivors of their entire family, extended family also. Israel's already destroyed over 50% of the housing in Gaza, flattened it. Over 11,000 people have been killed and there are still approximately 2,000 missing, buried under the rubble because when homes are bombed and you can, don't have the uh, ability before the next bomb hits to try to find the people buried or the equipment really because Israel from October 7th, 8th cut off all food, water, electricity and fuel. And that's why more than half the hospitals in Gaza have been, um, are non-operational anymore. <coughs> they don't have what's needed to treat all the injuries. They are out of fuel, so they can't operate the generators. They don't have electricity. And as of last night, early this morning, Israel has launched more attacks on hospitals. So as Shifa, a doctor who I follow, announced early this morning, like God, the Shifa hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Gaza, he said the Shifa has collapsed. Israel bombed the courtyard of a Shifa hospital and there's footage of strewn civilians and kids all over. It bombed a school that was sheltering 
displaced families, over 50, well, 50 killed in that school, and it continues, and Biden keeps saying there will be no ceasefire. So I, I don't really have words for that because we are witnessing a, a genocide under the pretext that they have to get Hamas, knowing that you are creating more resistance. Because when a people are occupied and oppressed, they're going to resist. And resistance through the years, and in all liberation movements have taken different forms, violent and nonviolent. And most of the Palestinian resistance has been nonviolent, except that nobody pays attention when it's nonviolent, nobody cares, nobody holds Israel accountable. And so you give more impetus for the violent resistance for those who say they're not going to pay attention to us unless you know we fight back with violence. And that's what was happening. That's the message we were giving. Hamas, which by the way is not only a military wing, and I'm no spokesperson or defender of Hamas, but Hamas is a, is a social movement. They, they have a government in Gaza and they have a military wing. But what was happening is that, you know, during times of, of no resistance, everything that I said continues, where people can't move, where they don't have clean water to drink. The UN in 2012 said Gaza would be unlivable by 2020 because 95 plus percent of the water is non-potable. So there are, it, it, it was unlivable. And the United States was busy trying to get other Arab countries to normalize with Israel and forget about the Palestinians. So you're gonna stay in these conditions, we're gonna forget about you. What message does that send? And so October 7th happens, but we cannot let anybody anybody believe or think or use it as an excuse that the October 7th attack anyway justifies what Israel is now doing. It in no way justifies what Israel is doing. And in fact, if anyone really cares about peace and for Israelis and, and, and everybody to be able to live in peace and security, what we need to do is to dismantle the system and the structures of oppression. And Israel right now is a settler colonial state. It intends to, and it has been working to, push out the Palestinian people because they want to replace them, right? And this is just a, an accelerated way to do so under the guise of we're defending ourselves after October 7th. Um, there's a lot more to say, but I'm going to kind of stop here to just see if you have any questions about the film, about anything I've said, about, I know, um, Sarah gave the website oh, for what we really need urgently is to continue pressing our legislators to call for an urgent ceasefire because that's urgently saving lives. And humanitarian aid, of course, is urgently needed. But what any Palestinian will tell you is that ours is not a humanitarian issue problem. It's one of freedom and human rights. So they don't want to be treated like a charity case where they do need urgent humanitarian aid now we also need a political solution. And that political solution, again, is to dismantle the structure, the settler colonial apartheid system, so that we can build, Palestinians and Israelis together can build a, a government, a system, a structure that grants everybody freedom and equality. And that is the only way that there'll be peace. Anything else is foolish and will only continue a cycle of violence. So let me stop. One thing I'll just say quickly, and I'll take this question, is it's, you know, people have been speaking up, and you might have seen like millions marching around the world and actions here, at, and the repression is great. So I know the, the NL, lawyers with the NLG and are kind of volunteered to represent some people who are facing um, repression for speaking up. Just earlier today, Columbia University suspended their student groups of Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Voice for Peace. They suspended both of those groups. So many people losing their jobs um, and, and forming other, uh, witnessing other forms of repression and being penalized for speaking up. But we can't let that silence us, right? And I hope you can find strength in numbers and knowing that we are working as a collective and our voices eventually will be louder. We see what our representative here, uh, Rashida Glebe, is, is going through. Um, 
it's horrific, but she's standing strong and I think we can each stand strong and there are resources and there are people to support those who, uh, again, face any kind of repercussions for speaking out. Just wanted to mention that. Yes. Could you comment on uh, some interviews that were published in her uh, a few weeks ago, I think, where soldiers admitted that they were the ones that were shooting at people in that um, uh, concert the because they could not tell Palestinians from Israelis and that Palestinian, I mean, uh, Israeli fighter jets were in fact the ones blowing up the houses. So, it, it, based on that, it appears that the Israelis killed many of the 1,400 people and many of those were soldiers. They are, they signed up to get killed. Yeah, we don't know the extent of what happened, right, on October 7th. We know that, well, actually just today it was published, in the Israel revised their numbers and now it's 1,200, not 1,400. I mean, it's still a lot of people killed. A lot of them, yes, were soldiers. Hamas did say that they only intended to attack soldiers in military bases, but that there was chaos and, uh, but I don't know. There's always kind of this, fog, you know, what they call the, the fog of war. What we do know is that at least two Israeli survivors of, you know, the attack from the kibbutzes did give interviews and both of them said that the Palestinian fighters treated them well, reassured them, didn't hurt them, but then when the Israeli kind of reinforcements or when they finally got there, they started a shootout. They started shooting up everything. And so these two Israeli uh, women both said it's more, more likely that the uh their own forces killed the israelis uh along with the palestinian fighters i, I never trust what israel says out of experience I and mean, when i was there things that we would do you know they would accuse us of horrific things and i know what we did and what we didn't do right and it's always just to put out there to 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 paint this picture of us as kind of violent and irrational and, and then only much later the truth comes out when really no one's paying attention. Like for example, I was part of the flotilla that went, started to go to Gaza in 2010, and Israel attacked our flotilla. It killed 10 of our volunteers. And one of the things that it said was, it put out these recordings. And in the recording, someone's saying that Jews should go back to Auschwitz and remember 9-11, those horrific stuff. Um, I was on the radio the whole time, you know, from the, the, uh, the wheelhouse. I was, I was the one communicating with them. I was all the time on the radio. That was never said. And it was only much, much later after everyone picked up the story and talked about anti-Semitic you know, organizers of this flotilla, only much, much later it came out that Israel admitted to doctoring these uh, audio tapes. So we always, and I always say there should be international uh, kind of independent investigation. And Israel always refuses, right? When it bombed at Ahli Baptist Hospital, Palestinians say it was Israelis. Israel starts saying, no, it wasn't us. And America, Biden jumped on to say, we believe the Israelis. But, but when he was asked, well, will you support an international investigation? No, we don't need it. We believe the Israelis. So that's what you have. I always, I don't know 100%. I'm seeing what kind of you're seeing. And definitely there is, uh, information out there from Israelis themselves that some of the people killed there were um, killed by Israelis. Will we ever know the whole story? I recently read that, uh, you know, they're burying people fast and so won't give, uh, I mean, this will hinder a full investigation into what happened because they're not allowing access to some of the areas and, and then burying the people. I, yeah, I don't know. Any other questions? Yes. Is the building watch available online anywhere? I don't know, actually. Rise Up probably has a website you can check. I know some kids who might want to see it. Oh. <laughs> I don't think it is. I, I don't think it is. Okay. If anyone knows how to get a hold of it, let me know. I, I, yes. Talk to Verbena. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? This is, uh, I don't know if you can answer this question. 
What do you think are the chances for a two-state two solution at this point? The question is, what are the chances for a two-state solution at this point? Look, now, when we're, we're hearing kind of this two-state solution thing being reinvented, um, I don't think that it is the, uh, one, I don't think that it is feasible, and two, I don't think that it is the most just actually solution or any, anything that will contribute to actual true freedom and equality. And let me tell you briefly why. So even before Israel continued to create kind of all these facts on the ground that analysts have said it made the two-state solution impossible, um, you had the talk of a two-state solution being that Israel exists to be recognized as a Jewish state. So my village is from inside Israel. It, my village was occupied in 1948, and so we eventually became Israeli citizens. But there are at least 60 laws on the books that discriminate against me. So lawful discrimination against me because I'm not Jewish. To where I can live, to um, you have Palestinian villages inside Israel that don't get services, that don't, at least 60, and those are increased every day. Just a few days ago, Israel amended its like, terrorism laws, and now they are like thought policing. So some of you might have seen the, the footage of them going to a Palestinian citizen's home and arresting her under a terrorism charge for having a WhatsApp status that said something like, may they be, or God give them strength, may they be successful. Who they are, but Israel assumes it's Hamas, and so are probably gonna charge this woman under their terrorism laws. It, four ex-members of the Israeli parliament who are Palestinian were arrested for thinking about planning a demonstration to call for a ceasefire. So it is very, um, well, the environment right now is very repressive, but even before October 7th, it, it was not equal. Uh, and because Israel declares itself and wants to be recognized as a state for the Jewish people, so a Jewish state and a state for the Jewish people, well, well how then are you going to have any kind of fairness and equality to your non-Jewish citizens. Many of them, like my village, and my, my family, who are indigenous, and Israel came and created itself kind of over our village, I will never be equal. And if Israel wants to maintain a majority then, then it will have to institute policies to keep Palestinian, the Palestinian citizens as minorities. Uh, unable to expand, unable to grow. We have a symbolic right to vote and we have members in the Israeli parliament, but we can never have, that we don't have the ability to change any of these racist laws. So whatever states, two states, 10 states, no states, it's gotta be a, it's gotta be a government that is for all people and that doesn't discriminate and, and assign rights based on your religion, ethnicity, or any other characteristic. And right now when they talk about a two-state solution, they talk about Israel must be a Jewish state. I'm like, I don't want Palestine to be a, you know, Islamic state. It's, it, it needs to be a state that treats everybody equally. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my understanding is that in, in many cases, Palestinians and Jews right now share as much as 70% of their gene stock. What is the legal definition of a Jewish person or of a Palestinian person? <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't, yes, in that, you know, when you, talk, when you talk about, or when you talk to Palestinians, they call Israelis, or they call Jews, in Arabic it's Ulad Amna, our cousins. We which know is, that. Which is literally true. Yeah, yeah, literally true. So, I mean, I know in Judaism, and it depends on if you're talking about reform or orthodox in terms of, generally it's by, you know, the religion of your mother, right, that's kind of passed on, but who can convert and whatnot, and going back ancestrally, I, I can't answer that question. But I know that uh, Palestinians kind of always talk about, before the creation of, of Israel and before the Zionist movement started bringing in an influx of Jews with the determination after the Balfour Declaration in 2000, in, um, sorry, in 1917, right, they, the Zionist movement had an intention to 
create a state on, on their homeland. But they'll tell you before that, they lived harmoniously. And it was only the Zionist, you know, the uh, Zionist movement with the intention to create a state that is exclusively for Jews where there was an indigenous people that caused the, the discord and all of the violence that we're seeing now. But yeah, and legally. Yeah, sure. What would happen if a Palestinian went into a court and said, I'm Jewish? Um, you know, like if a Palestinian tried to convert to Judaism? Because I know that some, some Jews who do consider themselves Palestinian. If they say, I was born before the, you know, this creation of the state of Israel, they'll consider themselves Palestinians. And yes, before the creation of the state of Israel, there were Palestinian Christian, Muslims, and Jews. Now, would a rabbi allow a Palestinian Muslim or a Christian to convert to Judaism? I, I don't know, and I, I don't know. I don't know if that's happened. But I know there was a question here before, and I didn't get to it. Is there still, or no? Just like, could you speak to the difference between a ceasefire and a humanitarian cause? Mm -hmm. huge. It brings the point to see not enough members of Congress, even someone like Bernie Sanders, not calling for a ceasefire. Yeah. Um, but we're also seeing local governments like Providence call for a ceasefire. Even Detroit City Council is considering it, but there's some members that are unsure. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if you look at the definition, ceasefire probably I think is defined also as like a, a, a temporary um, halt in in the fighting or in the armed conflict. But when we say ceasefire, we mean a, a stop to all kind of exchange of fire, a humanitarian pause. What they're talking about is obviously let's pause for a little bit, let's get some humanitarian aid, get the Palestinians a little bread and water, and then Israel can continue um, slaughtering them. So that's why this is completely unacceptable. And I think that one of the reasons why a lot of people, in, in Bernie Sanders has been especially disappointing here is because they bought into this, is we just have to let Israel wipe out Hamas, do what they have to do to wipe out Hamas. And the thing is, even if Hamas disappeared tomorrow, if settler colonialism isn't dismantled, there's going to be resistance. What might come next might be worse you know, than Hamas. But you can't expect Palestinians to say, we're going to accept this and not resist and just lay down quietly and die. And I think they, they know that. But Israel does have these, again, I know why Israel's doing what it's doing because it wants to take this opportunity to get rid and, you know, to pummel people as much as possible into submission and, and kill a number of people or drive uh, people out if they can. But why Western governments and why the United States are buying into this when they know better? We know our, our experience in Iraq, we know our experience in Afghanistan. Uh, we should be smarter than that. I think that I can't explain to you, but I think a lot of these uh, members of Congress that have been disappointed, have disappointing, have just fought into this. We have to let Israel do what it needs to do to wipe out Hamas. Um, and that is, like I said, flawed on so many levels. and. Uh, we can't just say, oh, sure, let's get Palestinians a little bit of food and water so that, and then ship Israel $14 billion in weapons to continue slaughtering people. Could you ever imagine a scenario, or how possible is it that the current Israeli regime would ever be held accountable in international court for what they're doing? Yeah. I wish I was a little bit more optimistic here because there are a lot of international lawyers. In fact, just a, on October, what was it? October 16th, I think a urgent letter was put out signed by almost 900 international legal scholars and genocide scholars, including Jewish genocide scholars, saying what we're seeing is genocidal actions. Um, so a genocide, is or will take place and states have an obligation not just to prosecute you know punish after the fact but to prevent so the you know the, the covenant on the it, it's on the prevention and prosecution of the crime of genocide which is a crime against humanity and no states are are stepping up uh even though they know and they see what's happening the international criminal court just today the prosecutor, Kareem Khan, published a kind of an op-ed in The Guardian. And it was really disappointing because even though 
he might want us to think that he's sending subtle warnings to Israeli officials and Israeli military leaders and whatnot. He goes in and says, when the evidence reaches a threshold where he is insured of, of securing a prosecute, like a, a conviction, convictions, then he will um, issue arrest warrants. And that's not the standard under the Rome Statute. So under the Rome Statute of the International Court, that's not the standard. You don't need to be sure of a conviction in order to issue an international arrest warrant. You need to just have reasonable belief that a crime has been committed, a crime that is under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And there are plenty, there's plenty of evidence. And Palestinians submitted uh, evidence and complaints to the International Criminal Court since 2015. Since 2015, the International Criminal Court has been investigating Israeli crimes. And in 2023, they have not managed to issue one international arrest warrant, right? How long did it take to issue an arrest warrant against Putin? And that just kind of goes to, even though I studied international law uh, in order to be able to hold violators accountable, it's just become so clear that the West has hijacked international law to serve its own purposes and here to uh, ensure total impunity for Israel. So it's something I think about all the time, like what needs to happen in order for um, Israeli officials and those responsible for these horrific crimes to be held accountable. I was part of um, some initiatives to hold some people accountable back in 2004, 2006, using US jurisdiction, using universal jurisdiction in other countries that have good universal jurisdiction laws. And what you ended up, what ended up happening is these countries would then change their laws to exclude the possibility that, um, you know, you could fight, even though they had kind of broad universal jurisdiction laws, um, they made them tighter so as to dismiss the various lawsuits that were brought. So there's a lot of international law and implementation of it comes down to political will and there's a lot of kind of political pushing that needs to happen. I think we, what we need to do is continue to build we, at some point, we're going to reach a threshold of people that say this is unacceptable and that will have to push governments to change. And I think the pressure is working. And the United States, somewhat, there was an article last night where a Democratic aide has said that their phones don't stop. Um, and this person, anonymous, said that they've never seen a situation like this where the, what the people want is so disconnected from what the uh, representatives are doing. So they're, they're under a lot of pressure. Um, France has, at first it was 100% with Israel and the United States, had just called for a ceasefire and said it was unacceptable that Israel continue killing women and kids at the rate that it's killing. So I think the international pressure is working. We just have to move it more and then maybe we'll see the law applied equally. There's still a few more, I think three more hands. Do we have time to take? There's three more hands? All One, right. two, three, four. We have more? Four? That's it. Four. Three more. Okay, let, let me go back. Who had the hand raised in the back? Go ahead, please. Yeah, the woman near the back. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, I can't stand up, so can you hear me? Yes. All right. I am a... Uh, um, uh, one of the constituents from the 12th congressional, uh, 12th congressional district, yeah, yeah. and our congresswoman, we call her congressional sister, <laughs> Rashida Tlaib, has been attacked mercilessly in the U.S. Congress and in the press over words that she says, like from the river to the sea which we understand, people who are oppressed, understand that that means freedom for all, because you cannot have freedom for one group and oppress another. So what I want to know, I came out here tonight as one of our constituents to find out and to look up, I'm old, so I'm not part of the viral network, and I want to understand
speaking of uh, for coming out you know I think the absolute best thing that we can do is make sure that she wins by a landslide in the next elections because what we have in the United States is a lot of people and a lot of members of Congress beholden to the pro-Israel lobby and their money and their influence and they're running ads some of them you might have seen them running ads against Rashida right now saying that she identifies and supports terrorists and things like that so all of that money, we have to let it know that it doesn't work up against the truth. So you don't have to kind of donate money to her campaign. You can just volunteer. You can tell people about, we have to make sure that she wins and wins by a landslide. That would be the biggest kind of slap in the face to all of those people that are trying to silence her. That's number one. <laughs> representatives, but any and all elected representatives in Congress and the Senate, and let them know that we support Rashida, and that Rashida has been with us and for us, not since this year, but for decades. You know, she's been fighting for the rights of everyone. Uh, consistently and without compromise. And, and you can also let Joe Biden know directly if you text ceasefire <laughs> to 51905. Okay, so ceasefire to 51905, and you can let Joe Biden know directly. That is it. And you know, there was, uh, if you're not uh, kind of on social media, I don't think the mainstream media played it, but when they voted on Tuesday night to censor Rashida, there were some very powerful statements made on her behalf against the censor resolution by African American members of Congress. And Cori Bush, for example, chastised you know, the, the, the sponsor of the resolution and all who voted for it, saying, you know, I'm not surprised because this is the body that thought that owned slaves and thought it was okay to own slaves. And, and um, Jamal Bowman also said that when you're vo voting to censor the only Palestinian American voice we have in this body, that will only lead to less empathy for Palestinians and we need more empathy for Palestinians and for people that look not only like most of Congress and especially people on the other side of the aisle that sponsored that resolution. So I think, and then there was um, a photo of the only members of Congress who have so far called for a ceasefire. And unfortunately there was not one white member of Congress. It was all people of color. Because we understand oppression and we stick together in solidarity, but that, we just can't accept that, right? And so there's a lot of social media activism that's going on that's great. You can do it on your phone. You can call uh, when you see a, a news broadcast that's kind of unfair. Call and let them know it's unfair. Call your members of Congress. But a top thing that we can do, too, is, like I said, make sure that Rashida wins. I, I should give a shout out to Jewish Voice for Peace because they have put out 
you know, statements, a nice photo kind of collage with a, a lot of Jewish members, constituents and non-constituents, saying that we stand with Rashida because we can't let them break, turn this into a Palestinian versus Jews or anything, it's not. all at once, maybe, and then <laughs> I think we have two more we can take. So, you had your hand up. Oh, I, we had one over here. Oh, we had one. Oh, she'll have yeah, her hand up. Okay. We can take them all at once, and I can try to answer them all. That's quick. Oh, you want to do that? Yeah. Okay. We'll do one, two, three, four. Ask your question, ask your question, ask your question, ask your question. Oh, and Sarah. Five. All right. That's it. <laughs> I'll try to like briefly summarize it, but I feel like there's been like a lot of the commentary centering around like Hamas's existence and like their actions like on October 7th and everything afterwards. And I'm still having a lot of like present like a lot of this information about exactly what Hamas is and like what their goal is exactly. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could like touch on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. What's your question? Yeah. So uh, you know, I, I, I guess I've been seeing a lot of posts uh, in reference to the natural um, gas field off the shore of Gaza, and I just wanted to know what you think is or how big of a role. Hi, my name is Sam Griddle, I'm the political director of the Michigan National Action Network, and I appreciate all the uh, words in terms of Biden, the U.S. Congress, and all that, but what did Tip O'Neill say? All politics is local. We have the Detroit City Council here, which is quibbling over one of the weakest ass statements of the <laughs> When I put my debit card up today, I got two tickets. We just left the Arab, American Arab uh, dinner out at the uh, Henry in Dearborn. And the other ticket was for Detroit City Councilwoman at large, Mary Waters, who is here with me this evening. And there's some significance because, see, when you talk about black folks supporting Rashida, it's real important to understand that there are a number of black folks running from Rashida and America's blackest and arguably poor city, Detroit. And we could go a long way toward simply advocating in front of the Detroit City Council for a strong statement calling for a ceasefire, not a humanitarian, watered down version, but a full ceasefire Stop the killing. Now, we know when we're seeing genocide and what's occurring. And what really disturbs me is that I'm two years older than the state of Israel. I was born in 1946. Israel came into existence in 1948, I believe. And 54 years ago, I gave a, a speech in East Lansing after having served four years. It's Veterans Weekend. I'm an honorably discharged Vietnam War era veteran. And I can tell you that 54 years ago, I gave a speech in East Lansing, an undergrad at Michigan State. I gave the same speech, a couple of, a mayor invited me to speak at the uh, uh, Dearborn Fourth Performing Arts uh, Theater in Dearborn. I gave the same remarks and caught the same amount of hell 54 years later, but simply saying, free, free Palestine. That's all I said, a few other questions. But, but the point I'm making is let's work our local units of government too. We all we need four other council people to accompany Councilwoman Waters here to pass a strong resolution. The nation is focused on Dearborn and Detroit at this particular time. And if we focus too far away in Washington and forget what's right here in Dearborn, what's right here in Detroit, we miss the boat. All I'm encouraging you to do, lobby the councilwoman. <laughs> lobby at least four of, of, of her colleagues on the Detroit City Council for what may sound simple, 
a strong resolution that demands a ceasefire right now. Stop the killing. We can do it. It's right here. It's doable. It's doable. Show up at that auditorium. You'll make a difference. Digitally, I mean, remotely as well as in person, right? Yes. yes. So, there's no excuse. <laughs> Is there a decent case, this is a rhetorical um, a decent case in the International Criminal Court for, under the Nuremberg Law, for the United, against the United States to issue a warrant against the United States government? President Biden, for example, for providing for providing weapons, money, et cetera, et cetera, enabling. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on the boycott, divest, sanctions movement and the longstanding uh, products to, to boycott Puma, Sabra Hummus, and there's others, and then there's some recent. Uh, ones that like Disney, Hulu, McDonald's, Burger King, because hopefully when a ceasefire does happen, there'll be work to do in, in terms of not purchasing Israeli or supporting Israeli goods or sending our money towards them. We can't help our tax dollars necessarily all the way, but, uh, but yeah, the BDS movement. Okay, so you have all I think so. The first one, the first one was about Hamas. Look, Hamas came into existence in 1987. That was like 40 years after Israel dispossessed Palestinians, a created state, killed thousands, made three quarters of a million, turned them into refugees, um, and even after Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza. Before Hamas, then Israel used to say the Palestine Liberation Organization, they're all terrorists. There's always a reason to not sit down and, and negotiate. You always want kind of that reason to say that these are terrorists. So then Hamas was established in 1987, and Israel, you can read about this, I won't go into it a lot, but there's, it's pretty well known that Israel actually helped Hamas because it allowed the flow of money to them and it saw it as a counterweight to the PLO, and so it allowed them to operate, etc. cetera. Um, what I would say is, so you, in terms of what Hamas is, it was founded as kind of a, a liberation movement. It's a political party, like other Palestinian political parties. It won elections in 2006, Palestinian elections, because Palestinians were so fed up with the ruling party, Fatah. There was a lot of corruption and peace process wasn't going anywhere. And so Hamas was seen as they had a lot of social, um, basically a lot of social programs and they were seen that they would be better. So it is a lot more than its armed wing, but it does have an armed wing. It's called the Azadin Qassam Brigades. Uh, but what I will tell you, at first its founding charter, I don't even remember what it says, but it was widely seen as saying, seen as wanting to like eradicate the state of Israel and whatnot. In 2007, it amended its charter, and it makes clear that our issue is their issue, what they say, and our issue, it's not against Jews at all. It is against Zionism, which is, seeks to take over our land because Zionism is a political movement that believes that this land belongs to Jews, period. That move, I mean, so their charter makes that very clear. Yet, they are on the US uh, terrorism list and your, you know, I think the whole EU uh, terrorism list, and they have, committed acts that target civilians. I don't like that word terrorism because we always, it's always easy to label you know, liberation movements as terrorists, but when states do much worse, they're not terrorists. <laughs> and Israel has done a thousand times worse and is doing right now, but they're not terrorists. And, and so therefore, kind of these labels, I reject. Do I want to live on, you know, under Hamas? No. Do they have more of like an, Isla an Islamic ideology? They do. But are they also very practical and reasonable? Yes, they are. But you never hear about that. For example, their two, their leaders, their spiritual leader and political leader, back in 2004, declared that they will accept 
like a two-state solution. Before they were like, we want all of Palestine back, and I want all of Palestine back, but not, not without Jews. I want all of Palestine to be a home for everybody. The people that live there, the people that want to live there, just everyone treated equally. But they said that they will accept this notion of a two-state solution and a permanent or long-term truce with Israel. And just at that point, while they, Israel had been letting them operate since 1987, in 2004, after their leaders made those public declarations, Israel assassinated both of them within months of each other. Okay. And it continues to kind of do that, just vilify them so that we are not forced to negotiate anything that will force us to give up any part of the land because we want it all. That's kind of the way it is. And that's why I said before, we can't accept this premise that what Israel is doing now in Gaza is in any way justified. Not, not the premise of it in, in self-defense, because it's not self-defense and you don't have the right to self-defense when you're a, a occupying and a colonizing power. And also, even if it was the way that it's carrying out where it is attacking everybody, schools, homes, churches, hospitals, uh, and, and cutting off food and water, that is a war crime. You cannot deny a civilian population the necessities of life. And Israel has done that since day one, and nobody has made Israel kind of reverse that. And, the, and weak statements from the United States about we want to see humanitarian aid come in and whatnot, and, but we can't tell Israel what to do. Yes, you can. Yes, you can, because you are the one, you are sending military reinforcement. You are giving $3.8 billion a year to Israel. You are now, you know, trying to get $14 billion more of military aid to Israel. And you are the one that has consistently protected Israel in the United Nations by using, the United States has used its veto, I think over 44 times now to veto UN Security Council resolutions that aims to hold Israel accountable. And as long as we have that kind of impunity, you're not going to have justice. Get rid of Hamas tomorrow. These, these children that have been maimed and, and left uh, orphans and seen what they've seen, I can't even imagine the trauma. Um, they're going to be your next fighters. So we need to have justice and not allow the world to say that this is about Hamas. But you see the, you know, the media is like Hamas wars, Israel's going after Hamas. You know, it says, sorry, the last thing I'll say, I'm, because it's so outrageous what they're doing to hospitals and all the pleas from doctors and medical associations and the UN, and they're not able to rein in this state because Israel, or the United States has given it in total impunity. It's just kind of outrageous. It represents a failure of the international legal order, 100%. Um, but Israel says, you know, as a justification for attacking hospitals, these are, you know, the Hamas bases. They put their bases in these hospitals. Israel has never provided one iota of evidence. If you have doctors that work there, you have international doctors that come in. You don't want to tell city doctors, international doctors come in. They're, our hospitals are not being used as any kind of, you know, to, if by, as a Hamas base or anything like that. Okay, I can't tell you 100% that I know, but I can tell you that nobody's ever asked Israel to, uh, to provide any kind of proof. It just tells you, and it'll show you some fancy graphics on the internet, nothing that is any kind of evidence, and yet they kind of obliterate these, these hospitals that they've been doing. So it's so dangerous, the climate that have been set and people thinking that this is all about Hamas because they are terrorists and they don't accept or won't live with Israel or want it. No, they clearly announced a long time ago they are open to a political solution. And just last week, Ismaili Haniya, who's a, one of the leaders of Hamas, talked about a two-state solution. I'm, I mean, and, and wanting negotiations and a two-state solution. It just, nobody listens when, they, when they're practical. Uh, what is the... Gas fields. Gas fields, yes. You know, there have been for years um, reports about gas fields and that Israel has just given contracts to um, some multinational corporations to kind of explore these gas fields. Do I think that that's why they're doing what they're doing now? I don't. I know a lot of people do believe that. I don't because Israel controls everything anyway, right? It's going to take the gas whether or not, you know, it's obliterating Gaza like it is now. Uh, so I think that this is just, again, when you're a settler colonial regime and your intention is to replace the civilian population, this is just giving them as an excuse to, to push people out to kill as many as possible and the rest to make sure that, or to try to make sure that they stay, accept their subjugation. Um, but I can't, you know, I, I'm willing to entertain other arguments, but just because Israel controls everything anyway, I don't think that that's necessarily the reason. And in terms of holding the United States accountable, you know, there, I saw a report, the Center for Constitutional Rights put out a report last month 
think on the 18th or, or something like that, but it talks about uh, U.S. complicity and the potential for the United States to be held accountable. Now again, it goes back to political will. In the law, can U.S. officials like Biden and others, and even members of Congress, I believe the law, the report actually goes into the complicity and, and the possibility that members of Congress who are voting to send more military aid when you know, when you know that Israel is committing war crimes with them. I mean, we see it. You, you have more information than even we do, and yet you're still voting to send more military aid. Uh, under the law, yes, they can be held uh, accountable. Can they, will, the internet, the prosecutor, does he have the, um, again, political will to do that? I don't think so. Is there any private cause of action that other than through a nation that can bring that before the ICC? Like sort of like a civil case? No, what you, what you have is you have, or, you have organizations you have uh, that can submit, even the ICC is asking for evidence, anyone that has evidence to submit, them, and they have a portal to submitting evidence. And organizations can submit complaints, and they have uh, Yesterday, three policy organizations submitted complaints to the ICC, the International Committee, I think, to protect journalists, either that or Reporters Without Borders. One of them submitted also a complaint because so many reporters, uh, journalists, have been killed, uh, more than like in any other conflict since Reporters Without Borders started documenting. Uh, but it will take, again, the prosecutor to submit a case um, and that is political will, right? It is, um, I don't know, there is not a case really where powerful nations have been held accountable and that's the problem with international law and that's why also kind of Palestinians, I, I taught one year law in Palestine and I just remember so clearly one of my students saying, this is all nice ma'am, but it doesn't apply to us, you know, so. BDS. And BDS, yeah, you know, one of the biggest examples of Palestinian nonviolent resistance is the international BDS call, which was a call that was put out by 170 plus Palestinian organizations and unions and political factions, everybody united to put out a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And it was done uh, after consultation, really close consultation with our comrades in South Africa because the um, divestment movement against apartheid in South Africa was partially responsible for bringing down the apartheid regime there. So Palestinians put out this call and we're vilified for it. And Michigan is actually one of 33 states that penalizes people for adhering to the Palestinian boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, call. So we have, there hasn't been a, an opportunity yet, like a plaintiff, so you can challenge it in court, but it, it has been challenged in various courts and has been found to be unlawful, but that doesn't stop the drive to you know, continue to pass more laws to try to um, scare people into not adhering to this call. As far as, and Palace, the demands of, for those of you who don't know, just quickly, the BDS, it calls for people to boycott, to divest from, so within your unions or your pension funds or your universities, and just last week, Wayne State University Student Senate passed a divestment, boycott, divestment, and sanctions resolution, which was great. But you can do this, not that Palestinians think it's really gonna have a financial impact necessarily on Israel, but it is about the, the legitimacy uh, that Israel enjoys. And that's what scares it the most. But so divestment where you can, and then hopefully pushing states to sanction Israel will, will come later. And in terms of the consumer boycott, there, is, um, there was an updated list that was put out by the BDS movement. And I would encourage people to go to the, the BDS movement uh, website and see what some of those are. There are lists kind of circulating that are more comprehensive, but the BDS movement has found it more strategic to concentrate on just a few rather than to try to attack the hundreds and hundreds that are in some way complicit um, with Israel. But some of the big ones have been, you know, in terms of divestment, it's been Caterpillar, uh, Boeing. These Caterpillar provides bulldozers to Israel that demolishes Palestinian homes. The movie showed a little bit of it. In 2003, a Caterpillar bulldozer bulldozer ran over one of my colleagues in the International Solidarity Movement, an American, Rachel Corey, and crushed her to death. And they were never held accountable. The Center for Constitutional Rights filed a lawsuit against, um, against Caterpillar, but it was dismissed on a political, what's called a political question doctrine. So it's uh, legal efforts, you know, continue, but the 
civil society efforts are so powerful and so important, uh, I would just recommend or urge people to go to the BDS movement uh, dot net, I believe it is, sorry, BDS movement to see kind of an updated list of what you can boycott. Uh, do you, unless you want to name off a couple of big ones. Uh, Puma. Puma's it. Sabra Hummus is everywhere, yeah. yeah. Soda Stream. Soda Stream. Yeah. Hewlett Packard is a big one. Hewlett Packard. McDonald's. Yeah, McDonald's is interesting. That's a new one because of, you know, the they were giving out free uh, meals to soldiers, Israeli soldiers. Yes. Um, all right, thank you. I'm sorry if there are questions that we didn't get to, but I really appreciate you being here and staying late and for keeping on top of this and joining us.